If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Next game is going to be a flurry of blows, and here's why. In this episode, we find some answers to where did the image of a warrior monk come from? And what other flavors can we apply to the monk? And how do we create a varied approach to races in D&D? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. And we have no discipline. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, yes, 100%. We have zero discipline. Yeah. I've got shit discipline. I'd, yeah, I've got no follow through either. So if you want to. <laughs> well, like this podcast is one of the most disciplined things that we do. But other than that, I mean, we're just, we're drinking beer at 10 a.m. We're... <laughs> we can... <laughs> All of our discipline goes into this and there is none <laughs> left over for any other aspect yeah. of life. Which became uh, painfully apparent as we were doing this episode on monks. <laughs> yeah, when you're doing the research on things and people and lifestyles that totally counterpoint your entire existence. <laughs> your way of being. <laughs> of waking up late on a Saturday and eating some waffles. <laughs> and that's that's the kind of energy and discipline that I want to bring to the world. Just a waffle drunk with a gut full... <laughs> <laughs> Waffle drunk lazy podcaster energy. <laughs> oh, oh no. After this, we're rethinking our lives. But for now, we're going to keep talking about monks because we've both played monks. They're a really fun class to play. I love me some monks because I love playing frontline fighters, I love being in the thick of it. Yeah. So, rogues and monks are pretty much my two favorite classes. I don't necessarily like kind of tanky, but I like being mobile. Yeah. I like being able to move around and get that, creative. On yeah, the that all comes from monks. Yeah. I love nimble characters like that because you can do all the chandeliers and ropes and all that <laughs> stuff. And when I have played that tank, I really just have to lean into how much damage I can soak up while I enviously watch <laughs> the monks and rogues. Pretty much. Like being a sponge for damage isn't quite as cool feeling sometimes. Like I think the the most interesting thing that happened to me when I played a like heavily armored tanky character was I fell through a dock I was so heavy and I had to literally <laughs> walk to shore because I couldn't swim for shit. While you held your breath. Yeah. <laughs> and that was like the cool, but like being a monk and running across that pit trap or literally running on water when you successfully do that and Ooh. you can like shrug off the roll, you got like, oh, I rolled a seven. That's a grand total of 23. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you feel like a goddamn badass. Yeah. And all of this fun comes from the concept of monks. And for this episode, I wanted to learn a lot more about the concept of warrior monks. And there's so many real world inspirations for monks that we could have dove into. But I wanted to focus on one because we only have <laughs> so much time. Well, there's an inherent challenge with monks, though, right? Is that if you do it well, it's really good. But you're walking a very fine line with the cultural appropriation that's inherent within D&D. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you you got to do it with a bit of a, a gentle hand because... Yeah, I mean, we're talking about monks, but there are so many sources that we kind of just get influenced by. And now all of a sudden, you're not paying true respect to the real cultures and the religions and all of the values of these things that you're borrowing from. You're just picking and choosing all the juicy bits and amalgamating them into this abomination. <laughs> that of... has nothing to do with yeah. its roots. Yeah. So there's there's ways that you can do it and do it respectfully. Yeah, and and I just wanted to understand it a little bit more genuinely and honestly before 
using some of this stuff for my monk. Yeah, and once you dove into it, man, was it amazing. There are so many interesting pieces to where that that warrior monk came from. And again, we're going to focus on one, the Shaolin monks of China. And Travis basically had to shake me out of looking into them because (laughs) there's no end. Obviously, there's a rich, deep history there that we're not even going to touch on. We're barely scraping the surface of in this episode. Yeah, and it was getting bad. He was like three tiers deep into the research. He had like flop sweat and the light (laughs) of the computer screen was just lighting his face at three in the morning. And I'm yelling from above like, Jordan, pull yourself out of this. You're in a tailspin. (laughs) Come back to reality. Yeah, it got dark. (laughs) (laughs) So after we talk about that, uh, we're going to go into what other wild concepts you can apply to the monk mechanics, Mm, Yes, which is going to be fun, which was tremendously fun for me already. And so it's going to be fun to bring it all up again. And then we're going to share a resource that we found to customize your characters even more specifically to your needs. And it's super cool. And we both got right into it. All right. Well, let's jump into Archives of the Ancients. This is the Archives of the Ancients, where knowledge is unearthed to add wild insights to our world. Okay, so take us into the world of this deep dive that had such a death grip on you. (laughs) Well, I forget most of it because I'm shitty at learning. (laughs) But um, just as a quick note, I'm not going to dive into the correct pronunciations and words. I'm just sticking with the English concepts because I would butcher that. (laughs) And we're a couple of ding-dongs. Yeah, I'm not learned enough to share that with you accurately. (laughs) So I apologize. But Shaolin monks are pretty incredible. Their art form is so long-lasting and renowned because it's got so many applications. It's used in military training. It's used as a spiritual practice. It's good for the body. So just for maybe dum-dums like me, What is Shaolin? Is it a practice? Is it a region? Is it, I guess it's kind of all of the above, right? Well, Shaolin was named for the Shaoxi Mountain in China, which is where the first temple was built. And it was built to accommodate an abbot from India that was spreading Buddhism in China. Hmm. And what we think of when we think of a Shaolin monk is a monk that's trained in martial arts in their specific type of martial arts that was developed at that temple. That's pretty wild to be able to trace back something so long lasting to a temple. And that temple was built in 477. (laughs) Jesus. So that's pretty old. That is wild. (laughs) And for quite a while, this Buddhist temple didn't really have much to do with the fighting side of it. But then Bodhidharma, who is said to have brought Chan Buddhism, who's got so much legend associated with him that it's hard even for historians to sort out what's fact and what's legend. That's how you know you did it right. (laughs) If you are doing so many incredible things, it is hard to separate truth Ah, from the the (laughs) legends, from from the fantasy. And so much of our culture and history is just like, this happened... There's nothing particularly amazing about this. This was just an occurrence. Whereas when you're really trying to set the stage for a a long lasting, you know, since 477. Yeah. You got to you got to mix it with a little bit of amazing (laughs) in there. So when he first got to the temple, he wasn't even allowed in. So he went to a nearby cave. I guess he he was a bit of an agitator. That's why. Mm. So he went to this cave nearby. And he sat facing a wall in meditation for nine years. Damn. (laughs) Without stopping. Now, that right there is a great character backstory. You've been waiting for your moment, your your legend to start. Hey, yeah, that's pretty good. And when we get into the more legendary parts of his story, in one version of this tale of him meditating for nine years before being allowed into the temple, he fell asleep seven years in. And he was kind of disappointed in himself. That's some deep meditation. Yeah. (laughs) I fell asleep around year two. I can usually make it for like 15 hours. (laughs) 
<laughs> when you're really trying hard. Yeah. I mean, when I'm seriously hungover, I can maybe do like a day and a bit. Yeah, but then I need a lot of sleep. But then, okay, so after seven years, he falls asleep. He cut off his eyelids. Okay. To stop himself from falling asleep again. You lost me at that point. Well, Please, no more. I won't, I won't get any grosser than that. But then another legend says that when he threw his loose lids at the ground, <laughs> the first... Uh. Gross. The first tea leaves sprung up, which keeps the Buddhists awake to this day. Delicious. As a reminder to stay awake, I guess. Holy butts. Ooh. No, thank you. So then he got into the temple, noticed these monks were kind of out of shape, and so he introduced them to his book, the Sinew Metamorphosis Classic, a series of exercises meant to whip them into shape. And that's the start of the physical training of the Shaolin Temple. That's pretty cool. Not a bad idea to have a uh, a book that guides you through your exercises as a monk, eh? I think you could definitely throw that into most characters, especially if you're playing any kind of... I don't know, I feel like anybody with any kind of discipline, i.e. not me, carries <laughs> a book and writes things down in it. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, a monk needs a book. And we've already got the concept of, you know, spell books and Dungeons and Dragons, but that's that's essentially what we're talking about for their physical discipline. Not only that, but I feel like that would be a great practice to get into as a role-playing character is to just jot down ideas in a book as a way of keeping your campaign notes as well. That's true. like, I'm actually taking notes on this stuff. But if you were, if you were developing your own style of martial arts as a monk in D&D, you could Ooh. be taking notes to, you know, taking inspiration from the things that actually happen in your campaign and almost creating a move based on that. Yep, 100%. I like that. So we're still on Bodhidharma. So the legend of his death is that he either went home or he died. So it gets kind of confusing. That's a lot of gray area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a vague legend. But someone passed him on their way to the Shaolin Temple and basically said, hey, Bodhidharma, how's it going? Bodhidharma was carrying one shoe. He told the gentleman not to tell the people at the temple that they'd met because doing so would lead him to great misfortune. For some reason, he ignores Bodhidharma completely and went and told the people at the temple, hey, I just passed Bodhidharma. Oh, Jesus. And they said, well, no, because he's buried behind the temple. And when they exhumed his body, they found that he had one shoe. What? I was, I was initially going to call the, call the person out for blowing up his spot. <laughs> exactly. It's like, shh, shh. Don't tell. Yeah, shit bag. Don't go and, <laughs> and and spoil the secret, spoil the surprise. But that's pretty cool. Yeah. So then they exhumed his body and he, he just had the one. And one of the foundations of this Chan Buddhism that really stuck with me was that the wisdom of it is not passed through words, but on a deeper level of understanding. And I think this is something that, that has kind of always been my base understanding of monks, but knowing that it actually comes from Buddhism is kind of significant. And a, a quick story that gets that across, and it comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, and he said, the teaching is like a raft that carries you to the other shore. The raft is needed, but the raft is not the other shore. An intelligent person would not carry the raft around on his head after making it across. So they're just trying to say you can't just tell somebody the wisdom of Buddhism. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that goes way beyond just any kind of religious teachings and to just learning in general. Like, that's yeah. some good stuff. The foundation of how we learn in the world as people. Totally. So I think that you can carry that kind of an energy with you if you decide to play a monk that's inspired by this. Just that like when people ask you questions or things like that, it's like you show people things rather than... That's pretty cool. I really dig that because you can play that up in either direction. Like maybe you're a struggling monk mm. and it, this is part of what you have to learn as a character yeah. is being brash and being bold and trying to just do things your own or like you think you know it. Beat the answers into people. Yeah. And that's part of your character growth is to start to learn to calm and be peaceful and, and teach people in a, in a more effective way. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason the Shaolin Temple is unique amongst other Buddhist temples is because of the martial arts. So they went away from the typical Buddhist beliefs around nonviolence. And it's thought to be related to some of the conflicts and politics of the time, but there was some interesting justifications that I learned about as well. Go on. I love justification for things, <laughs> especially violence. So, <laughs> oh no, Travis, we need to get you help. <laughs> um, in many depictions of Buddha, including in statue form at a lot of the temples, there are two figures that are standing next to Buddha protecting him. And the image in your head right now, Travis, is probably not of how they're portrayed because they're portrayed as these massive, muscular, hulking figures that are clearly capable hmm. of some violence. Yeah. And sometimes they're even portrayed as kind of having aggressive facial features. So the Shaolin monks kind of use that to say sometimes our beliefs... And our way of life needs to be protected with violence. Yeah. Some assholes need a slapping. <laughs> yeah, let's learn to slap. <laughs> <laughs> that should be your new philosophy. Se seems like an oversimplification, I know. <laughs> Travis's new motto. Some assholes need a slapping. I'm going to get a slapping <laughs> for, <learn laughs> for half slap. of this. And of course, yeah, like that self-defense is easy to wrap your head around. But there's this, a particularly interesting belief that came from that that murder creates an afterlife where you will be judged for your sins. So if you're to kill a future murderer, you spare the victims of that murderer, mm. but you take on those future sins yourself, sacrificing yourself for a better world. Oh, damn. Just this whole philosophy adds so much to a character. Like, that is, that's some good, rich stuff. That could be a that could be a philosophy for multiple different characters, but especially for a monk, is just like what is your justification as a monk of going out and well beating the living shit out of you know somebody <laughs> in in combat? Yeah, and it is for those higher purposes. It's kind of similar to clerics and especially warrior clerics. Is like, listen, I know what's going to befall if this doesn't happen. If I don't intervene. And if I do intervene, I may take on some of these sins myself. Like, yeah. that's, that's some pretty compelling... It adds a lot of weight to your actions. Yeah, totally. And so getting onto the f actual fighting history, there was kind of three stages of it. In the Tong Dynasty from 618 to 907, the Shaolin monks weren't especially skilled. They just used typical weaponry of the soldiers and armies of China at that time. Okay. So they were just kind of conscripted to fight. Then in the second stage, they started using the staff in the 12th to 16th centuries. And they were known as the best staff fighters in China at that time. And we're all kind of familiar with the staff fighting of monks. Yeah. Well, just before we got into recording, we were watching videos where they were like jumping on staffs by putting their one foot on the upper side and one foot on the lower side and just bracing balancing. and balancing yeah. on the end of a staff. <laughs> and my head just exploded. <laughs> yeah, I had to put it back together. Real Humpty Dumpty up in this studio. <laughs> but those, the staff is used because that has a specific Buddhist history as well. Buddhist monks traditionally use kind of a walking staff with rings attached to a hoop at the end. And this had multiple purposes like to fright off large predatory animals like a tiger, which I think is a wild because you see a tiger and you shake your staff at it and that's your defense. <laughs> Holy smokes. No, my, my defense is that plus pissing my own pants and therefore being unappetizing to said tiger. Yes. Good technique. <laughs> I can't wait till we get reliable jet packs. <laughs> It'll be way better. That's That's really impressive. And also just the fact that you live in a place where you could be a snack for a tiger is also a little bit mind-blowing. Yeah. I know we have bears, but it's not the same. Tigers are quick and sneaky. Yeah, they're terrifying. Bears are clumsy and they sing a lot, like you know, bear necessities. <laughs> but I love, I love the courage and confidence that comes with defending against tiger attacks with yeah. a stick with rings. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I'm some... talking about. Whew. But they also used it to scare off snakes and other smaller creatures as well they these rings clanging on the end of their staffs also were used to alert potential donors of the presence of a monk because when monks were collecting on the behalf of their temple 
they would usually remain silent. Oh, I see. That's cool. Yeah. And so because of all this history, it became the primary weapon trained with by the Shaolin monks. They were already very familiar with it. And that's not to say that they didn't still train with other weapons. That was just the number one. Very cool. And getting into some magic staffs, there are many wonderful legends that I came across. One of them was the legend of the Monkey King, who's got a ton about him in Chinese literature. But he wielded a staff, and he was the only one that could wield it. He stole it from a dragon king. There's a campaign in there for sure. <laughs> and uh, the reason he was the only one that could carry it, because it was kind of heavy. It weighed over 17,000 pounds. You only get to lift that by doing an ass ton of curls. <laughs> yeah, you have to You have to have a little bit of discipline for that one, <laughs> I think. Um, it could grow as big as the heavens and as small as a sewing needle. That's the other magic part, cool. which he would he would shrink it down real small and store it in his ear. I'm assuming so he could surprise attack people by pulling a cool weapon out of his ear. Yeah, you put your hands behind your head and then you just slowly (laughs) reach into your ear and pull out your magic 17,000 pound staff. That's where Die Hard got the idea. (laughs) And, you know, it can also fly and attack on its own. Okay, you you left the coolest (laughs) shit to the very end. You started with a staff and then a heavy staff and then a flying... (laughs) <laughs> and sentient magic staff like that's a D weapon for sure and the metal rings at the end of these staffs they also symbolized some of their religious concepts like the if you had four rings on your staff it symbolized the four noble truths six rings for the six perfections 12 rings for the 12 fold chain of cause and effect so they had meaning to the the people using them and to everyone else that i freaking dig that that's really cool like embellishing your weapons and the stuff that you carry to symbolize meaning for your particular character to their philosophy and their yeah. way of life there's so much that you can do from putting like you can apply that to any character if you are a an orc that just carries around a club start carving notches into that club for the number of people that you knocked on the noggin but <laughs> If you're carrying a sword, like or the number is... of people that you didn't knock on the noggin, <laughs> it's just gouge mark after gouge mark. Every you're just time. constantly whittling this. I didn't knock you on the head, but you, you may have wanted bastard. to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sitting here just yeah whittling my club down to a little toothpick, and then putting it in your ear. <laughs> but uh, for any weapon, like you could tie a red sash around the handle of your dagger or something like that to symbolize, I don't know, just like customizing your yeah, weapons. To just remind you of why you're fighting or things like that, yeah. Or to just hint at your character's personality or beliefs. Mm-hmm. That's really neat. And then stage three of their martial arts history was unarmed combat or hand combat. You would think that that would come first. Yeah, kind of wild, eh? <laughs> Interesting. And this came at kind of the same time as firearms, apparently. So, like, yeah, it wasn't developed as an actual primary fighting method for combat and war. It was developed as a spiritual and physical practice. Okay, that makes more sense that it would come after. Because I was just thinking, like, I learned to hit you with my fists before I learned to use weapons when you were a toddler. True. So (laughs) Nobody handed you... (laughs) <laughs> a dangerous weapon. Yeah, I just I looked at the ends of my arms and I thought I can hit with these. I can I can do some damage. Yeah, let me hit this toddler. <laughs> <laughs> let me hit this tiny <laughs> defenseless child. Good, good morals. Yeah. Um, these gymnastics that they developed were inspired by the Taoist practices and exercises that had been al- around for a long time, meant to cultivate energy or chi, and they were. Very important to the evolution of their hand combat. So yeah. this created a practice of fighting, healing, and self-cultivation that contributed to all of the their military, therapeutic, and religious goals. I'm just blown away by the image of, you know, you said that they were primarily an army there for a short time. They were used by the emperors in, yeah, in some of the wars that they would wage. And so when you roll up, in like heavy armor with weapons galore and the opposing force 
is in robes, ready to beat the living shit out of you with their hands. Well, see, that's the thing. They didn't actually fight hand to hand in the wars and battles. They used weapons in the wars and battles when they did participate in them. This was more but the hand to hand was an internal discipline. Yeah, gotcha. And that hand to hand combat, it was the baseline for weapons fighting. So, like, once they developed that, they realized that, like, this is what you learn first when you become a monk, gotcha. then you learn the other weapons. At that point, they are the most formidable foe on the battlefield. Because if you've got someone that's trained for a couple years with a sword and a monk that's trained their entire lives in hand to hand combat, and then you've given them a sword for a couple of years, <laughs> touche. <laughs> All right. I, I take your meaning. <laughs> so, I've got one more legend for you of Sheng Chu. A monk that was not endowed with natural fighting form, much like yourself. <laughs> Ass. <laughs> um, so he was bullied in the temple. So he prayed for six days to the god Vaprapani, who made him eat meat, which was against the Buddhist traditions at the time. Also an ass. Yeah. And this is a, a strange legend because that is kind of odd for a, a god to do. But around this time was also when Shaolist monks all ate meat and kind of went against that belief as a whole. So the god made him eat meat. And after that, he gave him the ability to get swole and jacked real quick, basically gave him strength. And uh, he busted those bullies' butts. Very nice. I love a good, uh, a good happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> so meditation obviously factors into a lot of these legends, the discipline of, you know, sitting with yourself. I dig it. And... Honestly, I think that's super helpful in terms of just being able to play a better monk. Like, if I am going to approach playing a monk from that typical Shaolin monk perspective, perspective angle, yeah, then I definitely want to do that with borrowing at least some of the core principles that come from monks in general. Like, this is... This is where a lot of this class comes from. This is the genesis of it. So to be able to go into that uh, a lot more honestly is pretty empowering. On the flip side, of course, you can toss all of that out and just <laughs> use monks for their abilities and their stats. Yeah. The and you can throw whatever veneer you want over top of that if playing a monk and either the the aesthetics or the religion or you just want to maybe uh, approach that without being marginally offensive by playing uh, a religion and a culture that you have no familiarity or <laughs> history with. Yeah. So you can approach monks, and this is my favorite thing to do, is to reskin stuff to be completely different, but borrow all of the base stats and abilities. So... With that, let's get fucking weird with some monks. <laughs> All right. So I've prepared three ideas for how you could reskin monks. The first one, this idea was actually seeded by one of uh, our wonderful Discord folks, Aldrost. What he proposed was a person inhabited by an otherworldly patron, kind of like a warlock, except rather than in typical warlock fashion where the otherworldly patron says hey i'm going to strike a deal with you you do something cool for me i'll do something cool for you this monk is actually inhabited and taken over by that otherworldly patron like it is Excellent. puppeteering you in a smooth and amazing martially skilled person that you really are not definitely a different take on the yeah the idea of a warlock working with their patron <laughs> it's just jamming its patron hand into you and making you kick real good yeah <laughs> so yeah with that idea what about direct intervention so your character has an unknown eventual purpose known only to this patron to be served out by the adventurer at some point in the future huh however your dumbass keeps following around this adventuring party for whatever reason. So not on behalf of the patron. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe like the adventurer's foot kind of kicks out in whatever direction the patron wants him to go. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens to be with the party. <laughs> yeah, nice. But your character has no offensive or defensive capabilities. And it's in the patron's best interest 
to keep you alive. And therefore, like most adventurers, can't rely on you surviving upon your own accord. Yeah. So it has to take over and and kick some ass on its own. So like on my own time. Yeah, like you're just a leather craftsman that makes the belt bags for the rest of the party. Or even just like the helper that carries all of the pots and pans and mundane items of the party. Yeah. You're kind of tagging along. And now all of a sudden, when it's combat time, your eyes roll into the back of your head. And from underneath your arms spring forth six tendrils made of darkness. Yikes. Yeah. Woo. So did, you've got flurry of blows covered. You've got deflect <laughs> missiles when one of those dark, evil tendrils comes out and snatches that out of the air and oh, whips it back. Nice. You even move against your will. So, like, the stillness of mind ability, which allows you to end a charming or frightening effect on your character imposed by an enemy that you're fighting, that person has been so good at rejecting being charmed or being feared by their own patron like they're so they're so used to this that they can just end one of those effects and be like i'm not no (laughs) no that's that's easy to repel so then you could take this in two different directions i was thinking you could go way of the shadow which makes total sense because now you're yeah you're like literally dipping in and out of the darkness like an eldritch nightmare yeah (laughs) like without wanting to (laughs) Well, your eyes are in the back of your oh, head. You're yeah, having yeah, yeah. an episode. Okay. The rest of your party is just like, holy shit, what the hell is happening? <laughs> I imagine you're going to get berated when you come back to your... Oh, yeah. You just kind of wake up with a little bit of a flop sweat and, and with all these new holes in you. <laughs> you're like, I don't know what happened. I especially like it if you're with a paladin that's like angry at you for stealing your glory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just like, that was mine. <laughs> you don't do that anymore. Plus, yeah. that was creepy as shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even if you took the way of shadow, you could be making horrific illusions and turning invisible. Nice. Or you could take the way of the long death, and now all of a sudden, you're stealing life. Like, mm. your eldritch nightmare that takes over your body is now stealing life like, uh, well, like the darkness, the the 90s Top Cow comic uh, darkness and Witchblade were like a twosome kind of thing. Hmm. There were there was some crossover events that happened there, but that was surrounding this like guy that had a whole bunch of evil little imps and could just go into shadows and then come out of shadows wherever they were. Yeah, and then could be like resurrected because I remember in one of the comics he actually burned alive in a warehouse and the darkness literally like stitched all of the meat back on his bones oh. and then he came alive again. That's just to cure wounds, you know? Well, it's actually (laughs) in the way of the long death because there's an ability within that subclass where you can be reduced to zero hit points, but instead spend a key and drop to one instead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could describe that in game as being like run through, like destroyed or torn in half or something truly horrific. Yeah. And then instead drop to one hit point and immediately stitched back together by this eldritch demon. Right <laughs> on. That these imps that do it from the inside. Yeah. Oh <laughs> just stitching them up. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I want the patron to be a tiny imp in my belly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that. Because my second idea is a halfling mech. Artificer, not artificer class, but instead using a Sun Soul monk. Mm. Stick with me on this one. This one's a little bit weird. <laughs> so you can play, so you can play a Warforged from the Eberron setting. And now imagine instead of actually being a true Warforged, you're actually like in an agile mech suit as like a halfling. <laughs> so you could play a halfling as a warforged. Or a gnome or something or like that. Or a gnome right? or, yeah. yeah, something like that. So like think of suits like the end of the Matrix trilogy where they're fighting off all of the Sentinels and they're wearing all those those big mech suits. So they're kind of like exposed in the front. Yeah, they're like, they're hanging out. Yeah. Or like Meek from Thor Ragnarok, that little bug with the knife arms. <laughs> Is he controlled from the inside? 
Well, no, he's the he's the bug. He's got like to- tiny little oh little yeah, hands, but yeah, yeah, he's yeah. actually controlling a whole body that is this like right. knife armed hand, and he's really agile. Yeah, not fully enclosed. But now imagine this suit has a magic orb on its back that's powering it. Okay. So now you have made of collected souls. Is it still dark or no? No, I I, I think you could probably <laughs> play this one a little less uh, less foreboding and gruesome, but. As this gnome is building out this cool suit and making upgrades, you are progressing in your abilities and your levels. Yeah. So there's an inherent, like, how I go up a tier every level. Yeah, it totally fits. And so at around the third level, if you were to take the Sun Soul Monk approach, now all of a sudden your mech suit has the ability you've just installed blasters <laughs> so now you're charging these like physical blasts with this cool magic orb that's on your back nice and you can roll that into all of the the rest of the abilities so like deflect missiles the orb is able to capture some and throw them directly back in the direction that they came from kind of like an energy field yeah deal. yeah your stunning strike could be like this incredibly high frequency bell that your character just rings when other enemies are too close you could have your searing arc as the sun that's like a flame attack or something like that yeah you can cast burning hands okay that's a flamethrower man yeah 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 that works pretty well the evasion ability would be like a, a temporary shield that drops into place yeah like yeah, like imagine like two steel shields that are just ready to to mm. come down and like block incoming attacks. But they'd still be like you said, they'd still have to be really agile. So this thing would be bouncing around. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of working some of these into the world as well. Cuz I'm imagining some kind of organization that teaches this. Mhm. So like you could have many of these gnome filled <laughs> mech suits okay. in the world now you're getting into temple monk territory where they're coming to learn to exactly use the... <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome uh empty body ability that you get it i think at like 17th or 18th level it's way up there but even once you get up to that point now all of a sudden that orb is able to generate an invisibility field <laughs> sure how cool would reflects that reflects your uh, light back at you yeah with science <laughs> <laughs> and of course all of the all of the gnomes and the suits would get together into a megazord style situation oh of course yeah that has to <laughs> that has to happen <laughs> well and then the final one that i had was kind of lowest hanging fruit i think this one's pretty darn easy to accommodate for when it comes to monks Re- yeah reskinning the abilities it's yeah pretty it doesn't easy. take a lot of creativity but just a, a good old street brawler yeah like a like an old school pugilist <laughs> we're we don't even have to get into this you get the idea that's badass to play a, a fist fighter yeah yeah I, I get you like a fighter doesn't have the mechanics to actually pull this off the yeah. class of fighter totally but the class of monk does and and creates a really badass, taking hits, dishing things out kind of a uh, character. Well, think of like Brad Pitt from Snatch. Mm, you yeah. know, Brad Pitt's character, Mickey. Yeah. You know, it just does the whole like rub the nose twice before you you go in and, and you can sit there and take a hit or two and then hit really hard. Like that's, that's Monk. Yeah. I mean, really, if you wanted to reflavor the Monk's dodging, like every time you actually get missed by a hit, You could just flavor it as taking the hit. Totally. Totally. (laughs) And with this concept, like, I just wanted to do some cursory research and looking up some character art for pugilists or brawlers, just do me a favor right now and go and Google. If if you have a computer nearby or you're on your phone, just Google half-orc brawler. And under those top responses that you're going to get back on Google is art by Brotifoin? Brutif- Brutifoin. <laughs> I don't know. Take a stab at that one. Uh, <laughs> and Ian Lanus. And both have created art that I think I need to play a half-orc brawler. Because uh, basically you got the male and the female version of a half-orc brawler and they are 
perfect. They're just super realistic and they draw you in and make you think that these characters are actually going to beat the tar out of your scrawny ass. <laughs> so you'll know exactly which ones we're going to talk about, but we'll also put them in uh, in the post on our website for this episode. We'll just we'll post them up there. We'll credit the artist so you can see the rest of their work. It is <laughs> incredible. It's so good. So that just made me want to play a reskinned monk as a brawler. Totally. I want to play, here's my pitch, a monk brawler that's in a mech suit that's got eldritch tentacles. You've gone too deep. Pull up. You're <laughs> you're in a spiral again, man. <laughs> All right. So I think what we're saying is the way we want to approach monks is either respect the source material or get weird as shit. Yeah. And that brings us to the next segment, the Temple of Inspired Hands. This is the Temple of Inspired Hands, where amazing products and revolutionary ideas are brought to light. So we love character customization a lot. And customizing your race has been introduced in a lot of different ways. But this one that we found from James Indracasso was really interesting to us because it kind of blends the races of Dungeons and Dragons together. Yeah, it allows for a lot of customization. And for me, ultimate customization is what I'm after. I've got a concept. I've got a character that I want to play. I want to find a way to bring them to life. Yeah. And sometimes rules as written doesn't allow for that. Yeah, absolutely. And if I haven't demonstrated my flagrant disregard for the rules yet, <laughs> I mean, this is kind of right up my alley. So in the blog post that we're going to link to in this episode, James makes a lot of really good comments about how there's inherent racism in Dungeons and Dragons. This isn't fixing any of that. Yeah. He acknowledges all of that before proposing this adjustment to the rules. Super salient points. And it's always been something that I've kind of struggled with as well. Is like in this world where anything can happen and so many different traits and abilities and this big, lovely, breathing world, you're going to see variation in all shapes and sizes and people and cultures. Yeah, it's a magic fantasy world. So why the fuck can't I do whatever <laughs> the hell I want? So, so what he's basically done is broken down the traits of every race in Dungeons and & Dragons and assigned them a point value from 1 to 4. In his system that he proposes, it gives you a certain amount of points to build your race from depending on your size, and you can spend them as you want, and you can create a really unique character from it. And it's really neat because in the post, he actually has a process for which you can follow. So building a base race... And then you take a, an ability score increase that all races get. And then you pick a size, a medium or small, and then you figure out your speed. And then from that, you can pretty much build whatever you want. Which, I mean, something great that came up in the comments, I think it was originally intended to be like, well, wouldn't this create things like a acid-breathing halfling? To it's which like, James replied, yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going for. You can How make cool anything. is that? <laughs> So an example of like some one point traits, uh, you know, you get nimbleness or resilience. So you have advantage on saving throws against poison. So pretty, pretty minimal kind of traits. Yeah. I mean, things like things that are more flavorful, like trance, the elf's ability to just go into a meditation for four hours. Yeah. All the way up to three and four point traits that are some of the really intense and fun ones like. Uh, you've got stuff like Lucky, one of the halfling traits that lets you reroll Infernal Legacy, giving you a whole bunch of tiefling uh, magic abilities. So under this system, I could have both Infernal Legacy and Lucky at the same time. You could. You wouldn't get much else with it, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I think be... I've spent most of my budget with just those two. You'd be one lucky devil. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the character concept. So... Pretty cool system. Definitely head over to James Intercasso's blog, worldbuilderblog.me, or you can just hit up the link that's on our page, hookandchance.com, and see if you like it. 
It'd be kind of a cool twist for certain games. I'm going to try this with my next character because this is this is just opening up a whole world of options. Yeah. I want dark vision. Suck it. You want to be a human with dark vision. Finally, you get your dream. Yes. I want to be a dwarf without it. <laughs> but that's the thing is that I'm also sacrificing yeah. the typical feats uh, that you get. Human plus one to every ability. Yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely pros and cons, but this allows you ultimate creativity. For those that need it. Yeah, it's really fun to sometimes play against the the normal type. So like, let's say you're making a halfling intense barbarian or something. And it's like, well, now you can take the relentless endurance that a half-orc normally gets that, that pops you back up at zero hit points. Well, and one of the neat abilities that immediately caught my eye is one of my characters is a goliath that wasn't raised on the surface. Right. So logically he would have some kind of sunlight sensitivity or so would you would think yeah that's true that's a that's a negative trait i don't think you can justify that he get dark vision from that <laughs> <laughs> i'll find a way they but did sure. something weird to his peepers yeah <laughs> all right well yeah let us know what you think tell us what weird ideas you come up with on our social media at uh what, hook and chance at on <laughs> did you just forget what podcast we have yeah <laughs> i was doing my dream podcast <laughs> what's your dream podcast it's a blanket review podcast called snuggle time <laughs> good times yes yeah, so you can reach out to us at hook and chance on twitter facebook instagram discord or reddit the sound effects in this episode were by tabletop audio so thank you very much thanks, thanks for, for listening, listening and, and build yourself a mech suit great games we all need a mech suit